I'm going to be doing most of the talking uh, tonight, but we also have a couple other um, friends joining us. Um, these are two speakers who are new to you uh, this evening. We have uh, Dr. Spencer Baer and Dr. Neil Newman. Um, I'll start by introducing uh, both of them just briefly. Um, so Dr. Baer is an associate professor in radiology here at UCSF. He was born and raised in New York and did undergrad at MIT, uh, medical school at Tufts and residency at Leahy. And he did his fellowship in abdominal imaging and nuclear medicine at UCSF and has been on faculty here since 2012. Um, so he'll be talking to us about um, all the ways in which radiology is important in cancer. Um, Dr. Neil Newman is a physician scientist and pathology fellow here at UCSF. He grew up in Iowa, um, moved to Baltimore and went to Johns Hopkins um, where he did an undergrad degree in biophysics. And um, he then moved to San Francisco um, for uh, doing his residency in pathology and is uh, headed to Memorial Sloan Kettering next year um, to do a research fellowship there. Um, so we're so excited to have both of them here with us tonight. And Dr. Newman's going to talk to us all about pathology and biopsies and why those are important in cancer. So we'll come back to both of them a little bit later in the evening. Um, I wanted to summarize last week's session um, for you all, again, uh, on what causes cancer. You may remember Dr. Kathy Hyland talked to us all about some of the underpinnings of the um, causes behind cancer. We learned that genetic mutations are responsible for cancer and that these mutations can occur either spontaneously or can be inherited. There are also environmental factors like tobacco smoke that can cause these genetic mutations that then drive cancer to happen. Um, we learned about a term called oncogenes, which are essentially genes where the gas gets turned on that drives cancer forward. Dr. Hyland used the analogy of a car um, to describe oncogenes. And similarly, tumor suppressor genes, which are sort of the brakes on the car. Um, and when those tumor suppressor genes get mutated, those brakes stop working and cancer similarly uh, will form. The single take home point, if there was just one of Dr. Hyland's talk last week, was that an understanding of genetics has improved the diagnosis and treatment of cancer. So the two uh, genetics and cancer are intimately linked. As for today's session, we're starting with this brief introduction. Um, I'm going to talk to you for about 40 minutes about cancer screening and diagnosis. Um, big important topics in the field of cancer. And then we will hear from Dr. Baer about cancer imaging and staging, and then Dr. Newman about biopsies and pathology. And we'll end as always with a, about a 20 minute question answer at the end. All right, so with that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and launch in to uh, this talk about finding and diagnosing cancer, a big part of what I do as an oncologist. The objectives for this talk we're going to first define the term screening, presentation, and diagnosis. We're going to describe screening tests for common cancers. We'll discuss the signs and symptoms of several common cancers. We will discuss the steps to diagnose these various cancers that we'll talk about. And uh, we'll go through six cancers um, this evening. Uh, it would be impossible to cover every cancer in one talk, even in a series of talks. So we're choosing to focus on some common ones and some uh, important ones that you've probably heard about, but that's not to diminish the importance of the cancers that we unfortunately won't have time to talk about this evening. So again, we'll start with defining terms. We'll start with screening. This is a commonly used term. Um, what it means is testing asymptomatic people, people who don't have symptoms to try to catch cancer or whatever disease you're talking about early before it has a chance to develop in something that is incurable or very harmful. I think of screening as casting a wide net. Um, this doesn't mean that we're necessarily using screening tests for every single person in the population, but it's testing some large group of people, again, who don't have any symptoms to try to find cancer. What are some characteristics of a good screening test? A good screening test poses minimal risk to the person who's undergoing the testing. A good screening test is easy to administer, has reliable results. So if I repeated the test, it would give the same result over and over again for a given person. It has actionable results. So there's actually something I can do about the results. Otherwise, there's not much point to doing the test. And there's some effect on the outcome. 
So if I do the test, something will go better for the person than what would have happened if I hadn't done the test. So those are some characteristics of good screening tests. And then the other big question around screening tests is who should be screened? This is a really complicated question. Who should undergo cancer screening? There are some characteristics that may make somebody high risk for a particular type of cancer, meaning that person's more likely in some way to develop a particular type of cancer as compared to some other person. So this is a really complicated concept, but basically there are studies that are done that are meant to investigate this question of who should get screened. And those studies for a good screening test demonstrate some kind of benefit for some group of people. And I'm being pretty vague, but we'll get into more specifics as we talk about different types of cancer. But wanted you first to hear a bit about what screening is and some characteristics of good screening tests. This is a major concept, just the idea that cancer risk increases with age. Different cancers pop up at slightly different times in terms of the age they're most likely to affect somebody. But in general, here's the pattern. This is the pattern of all cancers combined. And you can see that at a very young age, cancer is very rare. Although as many of you probably know, there are certain cancers that do affect young children. But in the general population and broadly speaking, cancer is really rare in young people and becomes more and more common with age with the biggest um, spike in sort of the 70s to 80s. So really the older somebody gets, the more likely they are to get cancer. That's an important concept that we'll continue to revisit as we talk about screening. Let's talk next about the term presentation. This is a term you may hear from medical people. What this basically means is just how a disease manifests. What are the ways in which a disease is found to be present in somebody's body? Diseases can present as the result of a screening test. So maybe someone's totally asymptomatic, no symptoms, and they're told to undergo a screening test because it's what's recommended for somebody with their age and their characteristics, and that test is positive. For example, a breast mass is found on a mammogram. That's an example of a screening test that finds a cancer, and that's how that cancer presented. Another way in which cancer can present is it can be what's called an incidental finding, meaning that some study, usually an imaging test, is done for some other reason, not looking for cancer or some other reason entirely. And all of a sudden the person's found to have a lung mass on their CAT scan of their chest done for some other reason. So that's another way in which a cancer can present or can be found. And lastly, um, a common presentation is that somebody develops one or more symptoms related to the cancer. For example, rectal bleeding in somebody who has a colon cancer. So these are really the three main ways that we as medical providers find cancers in people. And then we, it's up to us to determine what the next steps are. Common symptoms in cancer just to know about. Most of the time, symptoms of cancer relate to where in the body the cancer is. So I just gave the example of rectal bleeding and colon cancer. That happens because the cancer is in the colon, in the intestines. And if the cancer starts bleeding, then the blood will come out the rectum and that's maybe where the symptom will be seen. Other common symptoms in cancer that are more general, unintentional weight loss, poor appetite, fevers and chills, and night sweats. Those symptoms though are not specific for cancer, meaning that if someone has poor appetite and fevers and chills, there's other common things that can cause that like infections. So it's important to know that these symptoms may be cancer, but if someone comes in with these symptoms, they might have something else. So we are always wondering what is the cause of the symptoms? Could be cancer, could be something else. Okay, so that was screening and presentation. The last term I wanted to find for you is diagnosis, the main part of this talk today. Diagnosis is defined as the nature and circumstances of a diseased condition. So basically, what is the disease and what's going on with it? The word itself, though, comes from Greek, the Greek words for apart and recognize or combined, meaning discern. So what diagnosis really means to me is discerning, figuring something out, figuring out what's, what disease someone has, what's going on with that person to cause whatever presentation they're coming in with. Our diagnostic process as medical people has changed over time. Historically, the main tools we had as medical providers were talking to somebody to figure out what their experience is and doing a physical examination to figure out what we can find that might give us clues as to what's going on. 
But over time, there have been developments in imaging, in diagnostic procedures like endoscopy, biopsies, pathology, as Dr. Newman will discuss later, and more recently, genetic and molecular testing. So we have a lot more tools now in our toolbox to help us discern what's going on with somebody, what type of cancer do they have, and what can we do next. And this is just a picture to show um, a physical exam happening, and that is still a key part of what we do. And we also have a lot of other tools now at our disposal to help figure out what's going on with somebody. I like to think in the field of cancer of four diagnostic quadrants in terms of four big camps of things that I really need to know to be able to provide the best information to somebody about a cancer that they have. Imaging, diagnostic procedures, biopsy, and genetic and molecular testing. And for each cancer type we talk about this evening, I'll return to these four quadrants to help um, guide you through the thought process around that type of cancer. So now that we've defined some terms, I want to jump into six cancer types and go through uh, different elements of screening, presentation, and diagnosis of each cancer type. So my goal is by the end of this um, talk, you'll feel like you know something about these different types of cancer and how they're similar and how they're different. We'll start with breast cancer, a very common uh, type of cancer. We'll start by talking about some numbers and talk about screening for breast cancer. More than 280,000 people per year in the US uh, get breast cancer and more than 40,000 people per year in the US die from breast cancer. I'll just point out that that's a lot of people per year who don't die from breast cancer. Breast cancer is a dangerous entity and we've made a lot of progress in terms of helping to treat people with breast cancer um, and many people live quite a long time with it. Anybody with breasts has a 13% lifetime risk um, you may wonder why I didn't say uh, women have a 13% lifetime risk. Uh, most people who get breast cancer identify as women. There are some men who get breast cancer, and there are some people with breasts who don't identify as women. So I just wanted to be really inclusive with my language here. But people with breasts have about a 13% lifetime risk of getting breast cancer. The greatest risk factor, as with most cancer, is age. The occurrence of breast cancer increases over time as somebody ages. Um, also, people uh, with a suggestive family history, many family members who have breast cancer are probably at increased risk as well. And there are some specific genetic syndromes, the most common of which is called BRCA, um, involving a genetic mutation that puts someone at high risk for breast cancer. But age is the most important risk factor. In terms of screening, how do we catch breast cancer early? The test of choice almost always is a mammogram. There are some other scenarios where different types of tests may be important as well, but to remember one thing, mammograms are the most important screening tests for breast cancer. And then the question is who, to, who should get mammograms and how are they done? Anyone with breasts um, should think about a mammogram, but more specifically, um, in terms of an age cutoff, uh, we're starting to recommend anyone older than the age of 40 who has breasts should get a mammogram. We used to say older than 50. There's been a trend recently toward recommending mammograms for people uh, over the age of 40. Um, in general, we recommend them every one to two years until maybe age 75, though the cutoff of when to stop um, really does depend on the individual. And some people who are really healthy 75 year olds may choose with their medical provider to continue mammograms even after the age of 75. So I'm gonna show you this picture again, which is that overall sort of graph of when cancers tend to pop up in people's lifetimes. And I'm just gonna overlay a box here that shades the area um, of ages where mammograms are generally recommended. Again, just to visually show you that um, we don't re recommend uh, screening tests generally in younger people because the number of them who get this type of cancer is so low. And then when the cancer um, starts to pop up in sort of 40 plus year old people, that's when we start the screening. Um, so this is just to show you the concept in general that um, the cutoffs really depend on when the cancer is most likely to happen. You could start screening earlier but that's subjecting a lot of people who are not gonna have cancer to unnecessary testing. So that's the whole tension here with screening is how early is too early. And then on the upper end, how um, old is someone before we think their life expectancy is short enough that it's not valuable to them to get these screening tests anymore. 
So these are just the concepts to think about and how the conclusions end up getting made about the age recommendations for doing these screening tests. And that's really not to underplay the fact that some young people do get breast cancer. It's a really tough um, decision to come to these age cutoffs. So I wanna just dive in a little bit about uh, describing what is uh, mammography. Um, so mammograms or mammography are um, the screening test of choice for breast cancer, like I mentioned. Mammography is a radiation-based test um, similar to an x-ray that basically exposes the breasts to x-rays. Um, it does involve breast compression, which can be uncomfortable for the person getting it. The test lasts about 30 minutes or less, and uh, abnormalities found on mammograms do require uh, either additional imaging or possibly a biopsy. Like any good screening test, mammograms have been shown to reduce mortality from breast cancer, meaning that when people get mammograms as a whole, fewer people die of breast cancer as a result of that screening. That's an important um, quality for a good screening test. Mammograms are not perfect, like any screening test, and may unfortunately miss up to about 20% of breast cancers. So people can still get breast cancer despite getting mammograms done, but overall, people are less likely to die and less likely to develop advanced breast cancer by getting mammograms. Th this is a picture of what a mammogram image looks like, and that white area circled is the breast cancer uh, in this mammogram image. So that's just to show you what the output is. Um, how do breast cancers present? In uh, countries with screening programs like the US, the most common way that breast cancers present is with an abnormal mammogram. So no symptoms at all, uh, someone undergoes a screening mammogram and a suspicious uh, area is found in the breast. Other possible ways breast cancer can present, um, someone can find a lump in their own breast. Uh, maybe a clinician who's doing a breast exam finds a lump. Um, there can also be skin changes in the breast and I'll show you an example of what that can look like. You can see here the dimples on the skin. Um, that's a, a finding called peau d'orange, which is French for skin of the orange, um, which is what this um, uh, image is supposed to look like. And that uh, skin finding can signal an underlying breast cancer. So there can be some overlying skin changes uh, as a way that breast cancer can present. Also, lymph nodes can happen in the armpit on the same side as the breast cancer, so lumps in the armpit. And then for the most advanced stage breast cancer, when it's stage four, or metastatic, meaning spread to other organs, people can present with bone pain, with jaundice if there's liver involvement, meaning yellowing of the skin, or shortness of breath or cough. And these symptoms are because breast cancer can spread to the bones, to the liver, and to the lungs as some relatively common sites of spread. So you're starting to see that um, the presentation of a cancer, as I said earlier, can depend largely on where in the body the cancer is. I'll just pause to make a quick point, which is that Cancers that we call breast cancer start in the breast, and then they can spread to other sites in the body. Um, I get asked often, let's say there's a cancer that's in the lung, but when we work up that cancer, we learn that it's a breast cancer that's spread to the lung. Is that situation called lung cancer? And the answer is no. We call that still breast cancer. It's just metastatic or stage four um, spread to another place. So just because a cancer is in an organ, uh, it may have come from somewhere else. And that's an important distinction. Okay, so I mentioned we come back to these kind of uh, diagnostic quadrants of imaging, diagnostic procedures, biopsy, and genetic and molecular testing. Um, for breast cancer, the relevant imaging is mammogram, often ultrasound, and sometimes MRI or PET-CT. And you'll learn more about these different types of imaging from Dr. Baer uh, in his talk later. There are no real diagnostic procedures other than a biopsy that is done typically for breast cancer, but a biopsy is very important. And often the breast mass itself, the tumor in the breast will be biopsied, um, possibly other sites as well. You'll learn more about biopsies from Dr. Newman, but essentially a biopsy just in its simplest terms is typically putting a needle into a tumor to take a piece of it to look at under the microscope to learn more about it and to help us determine what treatment's appropriate. Genetic and molecular testing. We are doing this for many cancers now, and you'll hear more about this from Dr. Newman. Um, for breast cancer in particular, we test for estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, and something called HER2. 
Not important that you remember those terms, but that's the kind of molecular testing that's important to us in breast cancer and important to patients to help us determine the best treatment for them. And then sometimes we do genetic testing to look for inherited forms of breast cancer like BRCA that I mentioned earlier. So that was all about breast cancer. We're gonna go a little faster through the other types of cancer now that you've kind of got the hang of how we're gonna go through these. So lung cancer, another very common cancer. Um, 230,000 plus people per year in the US diagnosed with lung cancer and more than 130,000 deaths per year. So you can already tell compared to breast cancer that even though the number of cases is similar, the number of deaths from lung cancer is higher. Lung cancer generally is more aggressive than breast cancer, just generally speaking, but there are aggressive forms of both diseases as is the case with all cancers. Lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer death worldwide, accounting for about a quarter of all deaths related to cancer. Um, there's a lower risk lifetime uh, as compared to breast cancer in people with breasts. There's about a 6% lifetime risk in the overall population, but that's quite different in people who smoke who have up to a 25% chance of getting lung cancer in their lifetime. Um, as you can tell from that number, most people who smoke will not get lung cancer in their lifetime, but the risk of getting lung cancer for people who smoke is quite a bit higher than people who didn't. The numbers of lung cancer in the world are decreasing overall because fewer people are smoking over time. For lung cancer, there is screening that's recommended for some people. Remember I mentioned earlier, screening is for large groups of people, but not, not necessarily for everyone. We don't screen everyone for lung cancer. It's all based on risk. And because the risk is so much higher in people who smoked, the screening recommendations for lung cancer are just for people who smoked, specifically ages 50 to 80. And again, I'm highlighting that here on the graph to show you kind of where in someone's lifetime we are most worried about lung cancer. Um, 50 to 80 and who smoked for 20 pack years, meaning they smoked on average about one pack a day for about 20 years or two packs a day for 10 years, something that adds up to what we call 20 pack years. And they're, and they're either currently still smoking or they quit sometime in the past 15 years. After about 10 to 15 years after quitting smoking, someone's risk of lung cancer returns to about the same level as someone who never smoked. Um, but within those 10 to 15 years after quitting smoking, someone's risk is still elevated. So that's the rationale behind this screening recommendation. So not to have to remember so many numbers, but just remember um, for people who smoked pretty heavily, uh, lung, uh, lung cancer screening is recommended. And how do we do it? We do it with what we call low dose chest CT or a CAT scan of the chest, which you'll hear more about from Dr. Bear at the end. And we recommend it annually um, until they hit the upper end of that range or until they have uh, been 15 years past quitting smoking. How do lung cancers present? Unfortunately, um, unlike breast cancer, most lung cancers present as advanced disease. Some are caught on screening chest CTs or incidentally on imaging done for other reasons. And then here is an example of what a chest CT looks like and a, a tumor in the lung circled in orange. And again, you'll, you'll hear and see more about CAT scans uh, later tonight. Most people with lung cancer, unlike breast cancer, present with symptoms. So breast cancer, most are caught on screening mammogram. Lung cancer, most people unfortunately present with advanced disease and have symptoms at that time. The most common symptoms of lung cancer are cough with or without blood, shortness of breath, pain, or unintentional weight loss. And again, most of these are nonspecific, meaning that these symptoms could come from other things like infections but just good to know what symptoms could be consistent with lung cancer. Stage four or metastatic lung cancer, symptoms often arise based on the parts of the body that the lung cancer has spread to, common places being bones causing bone pain, neurological symptoms because unfortunately lung cancer um, spreads to brain a good amount of the time, as well as constitutional symptoms, meaning general symptoms like fevers and chills or weight loss. So those are common symptoms of stage four or metastatic lung cancer. Here are diagnostic quadrants for lung cancer. What imaging is common? CTs, CAT scans, PET CTs are commonly used, and MRI scans often of the brain. And you'll hear more about that imaging um, at the end of the evening. Um, 
procedures done for people with suspected lung cancer. Many will undergo a bronchoscopy, which is a, a scope with a camera on the end of it that goes in through the mouth and down the, the windpipe, down the trachea, to look inside the lungs. A thoracoscopy is a minor surgery done to put a camera into the chest through the chest wall to look at areas in and around the lungs as well. Um, one way or another, a biopsy is important in lung cancer and either a mass in the lung that's found or one of the sites if the lung cancer is spread elsewhere are uh, typically important to biopsy. Genetic and molecular testing is quite important in lung cancer. There have been a lot of advances in terms of treatments based on different molecular features of lung cancer. Um, EGFR is a really commonly mutated gene in lung cancer that does have important treatment implications. So that and several other genetic or molecular markers are important for us to look at in people who have lung cancer. Lung cancer is usually not inherited, so we don't usually check inherited genes for lung cancer. All right, so that's breast and lung cancer. Now on to another common cancer, colon cancer. And as usual, we'll start with some numbers. More than 150,000 people per year in the US develop colon cancer and more than 50,000 per year die from colon cancer. Another cancer where we've had more and more success in treating and helping people live longer, but there are of course aggressive forms and many people do still die from this common cancer. There's about a 4% lifetime risk for people of developing colon cancer. And unfortunately, we're seeing colon cancer more and more commonly in younger and younger people. So that's a trend that we've been observing in oncology over time in the United States. The biggest risk factors as usual, age, the older someone gets, the more likely they are to develop colon cancer. And similar to some other cancers um, like breast cancer, colon cancer does have a certain amount of inheritance. So a suggestive family history of multiple family members with colon cancer um, may suggest a genetic syndrome, a common one being Lynch syndrome that um, is associated with an increased risk of colon cancer. There are several options for screening tests for colon cancer. Um, the most kind of commonly referenced one has been the colonoscopy. That's still one of the top recommended screening tests and is recommended to be done every 10 years. And we'll come in a second to who should get it. Um, another option is stool testing. There's a couple different options for looking at the stool. There's FIT testing, which is an immune test that looks for uh, either blood in the stool or advanced fit testing can also even look for cancer DNA in the stool. And then there's fecal occult blood testing, which is an older form that also just looks for blood in the stool. Anyone who has positive stool testing needs a colonoscopy to look inside and see what's actually going on. Colonoscopy, many are probably familiar with, but just for anyone who isn't, it's uh, similar to a bronchoscopy. It's a scope that has a camera on the end that goes into the rectum and, it, and snakes through the colon to directly visualize what's going on and find any tumors or anything inside. Another example of a screening option for colon cancer is CT colonography. That's a CAT scan that can be done every five years and can substitute in some people for colonoscopy. And lastly, a sigmoidoscopy, which is a sort of smaller scope compared to a colonoscopy, can be done in conjunction with stool testing. So the take home here is there's several options for colon cancer screening. And traditionally, we say the best option for anyone is the one that they'll do. So um, whichever one is most easy to do or convenient um, or preferable to an individual is the one that's typically recommended. Um, who to screen for colon cancer. So I mentioned earlier that there's more and more cases in younger people. So we used to say 50 or older, now we're saying 45 or older. For most people, we recommend between ages 45 to 75 getting screening for colon cancer at the intervals I mentioned above. Um, there are some younger people who may be at higher risk based on family history, and those people discuss with their medical providers about when to start screening for colon cancer. And as usual, I'm going to show you the graph. And this is the age range just uh, depicted for you here of when people should get screened for colon cancer. So jumping now to presentation of colon cancer, how does colon cancer actually manifest? Um, despite screening tests that we have, and I mentioned a few options, most colon cancers are unfortunately still found after symptoms um, onset. Though many are found by screening tests, up to about 30% of colon cancers are found relatively early by colonoscopy, stool testing, one of those options I mentioned. The most common symptoms of colon cancer 
include change in bowel habits. So going to the bathroom more or less often than usual, change in what the stool actually looks like, including the presence of blood. Some people actually can feel a tumor or a mass in their rectum. Um, some people get tired because they're having this uh, blood loss slowly over time through their stool, otherwise called anemia. And some people develop pain in their abdomen. So those are the common presenting symptoms. And as usual, I'll say that uh, most of these are not specific. Um, anemia can be caused by many things. Change in bowel habits can be caused by many things. So just because one or more of these symptoms is present doesn't mean that we know for sure someone has cancer until we've done the rest of the workup. Stage four, metastatic. Um, colon cancer often spreads within the abdomen. So people with advanced disease may have abdominal pain or distension of the abdomen early satiety, meaning that they, um, they fill up when they're eating much earlier than they're used to, used to being able to eat more or feeling hungry for longer, um, or a cough because colorectal cancer, colon cancer can spread to the lungs. Here's a diagram of the colon. Um, the colon is uh, in the abdomen. It's also called the large intestine, and it sort of wraps around the periphery of the abdomen, and uh, at the end of it transitions to the rectum. Um, and this uh, image on the um, right side is an image from a colonoscopy of what a colon cancer may actually look like in the colon. And here's the diagnostic quadrants for colon cancer. Uh, common imaging used includes CAT scans, occasionally MRI scans. The most common diagnostic procedure is a colonoscopy, which I've mentioned a few times now, to actually go in and look at the tumor. During that colonoscopy, a biopsy of a tumor like the photo you just saw can be taken and potentially a biopsy of another site in the body may be important as well, depending on if the cancer is spread. Genetic and molecular testing is really commonly done in colon cancer. Um, we're looking for different uh, genetic changes in, uh, that are common in inherited syndromes in colon cancer. And some of these genetic changes may actually allow us to use certain types of therapies that are more novel and important. So I have about five minutes left in my talk, and we've got uh, just a few more cancers to cover. Um, prostate cancer um, is another really common type of cancer. More than 260,000 people per year develop prostate cancer in the United States and more than 30,000 deaths per year um, in the U.S. Another type of cancer where we actually do pretty well helping people live uh, quite a while with prostate cancer, and many prostate cancers are uh, found early and can be cured. There's about a 13% lifetime risk for people who have prostates. Um, many people out there don't, or many people have had their prostates removed for other reasons. Similar theme, age is the greatest risk factor. The older someone gets, the more likely they are to develop prostate cancer. And similar theme um, to other cancers, genetics is really important for prostate cancer as well. And there are genetic associations um, that increase someone's risk of prostate cancer. There is a screening test for prostate cancer. It's probably the most controversial one among the screening tests we've talked about so far. Um, the benefit shown uh, is small compared to the other screening tests we've covered so far uh, tonight. But the test is a blood test and it's looking for a level of uh, something called PSA or prostate specific antigen. And again, it's just a blood test. Um, this blood test, unfortunately, is not specific for prostate cancer, though the higher the level that comes back for the PSA, the more specific it is. So if it's really, really high, it's very likely to be prostate cancer. Um, if it's really low, but still a little elevated, it could be from some other thing in the prostate. For those who decide to pursue PSA screening, the age range recommended is typically between 50 and 70 years old. So start at age 50 and go until age 70 and stop in general when life expectancy is felt to be less than 10 years. That differs um, depending on the person you're talking about. There's some really healthy 70 year olds out there who may wanna keep screening and others may wanna stop around that time or even earlier. And again, I'll just show you the graph here and here's the age range for prostate cancer where screening is recommended um, if it is done. How does prostate cancer present? Um, most actually are found by PSA screening at an asymptomatic phase, meaning no one that the people don't have symptoms at that point. Uh, most are early stage when they're found, meaning they can still be cured. The symptoms that are present, um, if someone has symptoms, tend to be urinary symptoms because the prostate's really close to the urinary tract. Um, some people may have bloody urine or bloody semen because the prostate's involved in ejaculate. 
And uh, these symptoms, though, all of them are, when they're present, more commonly due to some non-cancer cause. So again, a common theme, no symptom here tells us for sure someone has prostate cancer. They may have something else causing any of these symptoms. So further investigation is needed. Prostate cancer most commonly spreads if it is going to spread to bone. So if someone comes in with stage four prostate cancer, typically their presenting symptom is bone pain. Here's an MRI scan of a prostate uh, cancer. The prostate gland is that big kind of central circle. And then uh, there's cancer in the prostate gland itself and the arrows are pointing to a piece of the cancer extending beyond the prostate and pushing in on the rectum below. So a rectal exam may be part of the workup for prostate cancer. That's because if a finger is placed inside the rectum, you can feel part of the prostate and this may be uh, felt as a lump in the prostate through a rectal exam. So diagnostic quadrants, uh, imaging, CTs, bone scans, and MRIs are commonly used in prostate cancer. A uh, diagnostic procedure, a transrectal ultrasound, um, traditionally is done when looking for prostate cancer, and a biopsy of the prostate can be done with that ultrasound done transrectally or through the rectum, though more and more commonly MRIs are being used uh, to image and even a biopsy uh, prostate cancers. And genetic and molecular testing is common, especially in advanced prostate cancer. I just wanted to quickly take a look at the liquid malignancies. These are less common than the four uh, cancers we just covered. By liquid malignancy, I mean leukemia, lymphoma, and multiple myeloma. And we'll just spend a couple minutes on these. These cancers of the blood are rare, as you can see here, compared to breast, prostate, lung, and colon cancer. Um, the number of people who get them is just quite a bit less, but I still wanted to at least briefly mention them. Um, blood cancers originate uh, from the bone marrow, typically. Um, lymphomas, though, um, involve the bone marrow many times, but uh, actually originate or form in the lymph nodes, another part of the um, sort of blood-related system. So how do we look at the bone marrow? You may have heard of a bone marrow biopsy. These are commonly done, these procedures in these types of blood cancers. And I wanted to briefly show you what a bone marrow biopsy looks like and how it works. Um, I've done several of these as part of my practice and training as an oncologist. Um, we'll have somebody typically lie on their belly and we uh, numb them up and use a needle to insert into sort of the back of the hip bone on one side, as you can see in this diagram. And we then remove a liquid and a small solid component of the bone marrow to look at under the microscope and see if there's a blood cancer present. I'll talk briefly about leukemia. Um, the numbers are quite a bit smaller, but this disease can certainly make people very sick. Um, you can see the numbers here and I'll let you kind of look at the graph. Um, there's a couple different forms of leukemia. Some are acute or they're kind of fast moving and aggressive, and others are chronic or more slow growing diseases. You may have heard of AML, ALL, CML, CLL. These are all acronyms for different types of leukemias. The AML, ALL are those acute, faster moving ones, more aggressive. CML, CLL are slower moving. There are no screening tests for these blood cancers. So we, they only come to attention either when we discover them by accident or if someone develops symptoms that lead us down this path. Symptoms of leukemia can manifest in multiple body systems. I won't go into this in detail just for time's sake, but just wanted to say that because the blood is ubiquitous in the body, it's kind of everywhere, people can develop symptoms in all sorts of places in their body from leukemia. And the diagnostic quadrants, imaging is not usually helpful for leukemia. It's really all about doing blood work and the bone marrow biopsy to really look at the blood and the bone marrow to find this disease. And genetic and molecular testing are important in leukemia. Lymphoma, this is the last type of cancer I'll briefly talk about. Another blood cancer, more common than leukemia, but less common than the other cancers we talked about. There are more than 60 different types of lymphomas. Similar to leukemias, there are more aggressive ones and more slow growing ones. You may have heard of Hodgkin or non-Hodgkin lymphoma. That's just two different large groups of um, lymphoma. Non-Hodgkin is a larger group and more common. Hodgkin is relatively rare. Again, aggressive in uh, more slower moving forms. And similar to leukemia and the other blood cancers, there's no screening test, no test we do in the general population to catch this type of cancer early. It really comes to attention through either finding something accidentally through a workup for something else or symptoms that develop. 
Lymphoma, similar to leukemia, because the lymph system is throughout the body, can really manifest in many different places. Um, but the lymph nodes are a key target for where this cancer may develop. Here's an example of what somebody who has an enlarged lymph node in their neck may look like. This is a pretty extreme example. A lot of times lymph nodes are more subtle to discover, but that's what a large one may look like. And that lymph node would probably need to be biopsied to figure out if that's lymphoma. So a diagnosis of lymphoma, um, CAT scans and PET CTs are common imaging that are used. Um, depending on the location of the lymph nodes, different procedures may be needed to access them. Some of the lymph nodes are deep inside the body, so we may need some procedures to get to them. Um, a lymph node biopsy is usually crucial for the diagnosis of lymphoma, and bone marrow biopsies are needed for some types, but not all types of lymphoma. And similar to leukemia and other cancers we talked about tonight, genetic and molecular testing is important. So I'll end by just summarizing some take-home points. We went through six different types of cancers and learned a bit about screening, presentation, and diagnosis. Effective screening tests catch cancers early and reduce mortality. There are effective screening tests for some cancers, namely the most common ones, but not for others. We want to screen people in general who have sufficiently high risk, which may be hard to define, but age and other risk factors we discussed tonight can really help guide those decisions about who to screen. Cancers often present with symptoms based on the anatomic location of the cancer in the body. So if the cancer is in the lung, someone has a cough, et cetera. When cancer is suspected, imaging, biopsies, and genetic and molecular testing are common next diagnostic steps. So those are the take-home points for uh, this talk. And I want to reintroduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Spencer Baer, who is a radiologist. And after him, we'll hear from Dr. Neil Newman, who is a pathologist. And we're excited to hear from them uh, next to hear more about imaging and uh, biopsies and pathology. Thank you very much, Sam. That was fantastic. Thank you all for being out here today. My, again, my name is Spencer Baer. I'm a radiologist at the University of California, San Francisco. And for the next 10 minutes or so, I'm talking about the role of imaging in cancer. Objectives, Sam touched, did a wonderful job reviewing screening. So I'm going to touch a little bit about cancer staging. Answer the question, what is radiology? Who are we? What do we do? How is it done? And along the way, highlight some different imaging techniques and how they are used in cancer. So what is cancer staging? So once a cancer is found, either through presentation or screening, staging is often the next step after we've gotten the sample and we determined that the patient has cancer. What it is, is it refers to the extent of the disease and helps the treatment team plan the next course of action, whether it's going to be going on to surgery, is it going to be on the chemotherapy, or will be radiation. There are many different cancer staging systems. They're all particular to the specific type, subtype of cancer. Don't have time to go through all of them. I'm just going to highlight the one that is used quite frequently, the TNM staging system. What is the TNM staging system? So it's a, this stands as an initialism. What it means is each letter stands for a different thing. The T stands for the tumor. What does this mean? So when the tumor staging is applied, the T staging, is how big the tumor is. Where does it go? What is it involved? Is it a prostate cancer tumor that's going in and invading into the adjacent structures? This all will depend on, this will all impact the T staging. And there's the N staging. N staging stands for lymph node involvement center. Are there regional lymph nodes involved? And lastly, M staging. This stands for the presence of metastasis. What metastasis means, as Sam was talking about, it means that cancer is spread to other organs. So if it is a lung cancer, is there metastasis to the abdomen and the adrenal glands or the liver? Then we'll get these TNM staging. They're each followed by a letter or a number that gives specific information to the treating physician or the treating physician's team. I'll give you an example. This is a patient who, for example, let's say has rectal cancer. E3BN0M0. So if you ever hear this, this is what they're talking about. So for rectal cancer, a T3B, that's the T staging. What it means in rectal cancer, that is tumor has extended two to three, two to five millimeters beyond the wall of the rectum. So it means the tumor mass in the rectum has extended into the fat adjacent to the rectum. Then N0, M0. That means there is no original lymph nodes and no metastases. 
So what is radiology? What do we have to do in, the multi in this grand puzzle? As Sam alluded to, there's various aspects in which radiology comes to play. So first off, what is radiology? It's a subspecialty of medicine that uses images to aid in the diagnosis of disease. And who are we? Well, for all these imaging and radiology, it requires a team effort. First, the radiology technologists. These are often the things that people that patients see when they come to get these exams done. They're specially trained individuals that are trained to require images that the radiologist interpreted. These are the plain films, the CTs, MRIs, or nuclear medicine pet technologists. Then there's a diagnostic radiologist. These are medical doctors who specialize in interpreting the images and providing a report to the referring team. And then this radiology assessment is often paired with all the other clinical information, whether it's the physical examination, the patient's age, demographics, or genetics to formulate the clinical plan. So what are all these different imaging techniques I'm going to go through a few of them. There's several ones out there. So we're going to talk about some plain film x-rays, ultrasound, computer tomography that Sam was alluded to, magnetic resonance imaging, and lastly, nuclear medicine with PET emission tomography and positron emission tomography, also known as PET. So first off, plain film x-rays. How is it performed? This is a nice little diagram of a patient who's getting a chest x-ray. This machine produces radiation called x-rays, which are focused on a particular body part, in this case, the patient's chest. They go through and they hit a special type of film that then produces the image such as the chest x-ray. So when it's used in cancer, tridominally it's used with, with, for mammograms for screening of breast cancers. We used to use this frequently for uh, patients coming in with cough and suspected uh, lung cancer. But now with the advent of CT and low-dose CT, we can use CT. It's moved on to screening with CT. Not routinely used for staging. It is not used at all for staging. It doesn't provide enough information to give the referring team accurate DNN staging criteria. So what about ultrasound? What I mean by ultrasound? Well, how is it performed? So it's a specialized machine that produces sound waves to create the images. So this is a little probe. There's multiple different probes that we use depending on the indication. What happens is the machine produces a sound, goes and bounces off the object, and it comes back and it's read by the same probe, and it, the computer then makes these images. It's like sonar. It bounces out, pumps back, and then it gives us the information that we need to make the images. We use this for screening for liver cancers. This is an example of a, a right upper quadrant ultrasound in a patient with cirrhosis looking for liver masses. This is the liver right here. This is what you typically see. So we're looking for different types of uh, what's called echogenicity, different to different colors of gray. So it's either dark gray or light gray. This, all the lighter, lighter gray or the whiter is all fat. And this triangle right here is the patient's liver. We can also use it to aid physicians in performing biopsies to diagnose cancers or stage cancers, such as a patient who's getting a lymph node biopsy in the, in the neck with thyroid cancer. This little light white line right here is the needle biopsy, so we can put it on and help make sure we get exactly where we intend to go. This is, again, the needle going down, and this is the lymph node, and then this comes out, and we hand it to our pathologist who performs the, uh, the stainings and gives and provides the information whether it's malignant or not. Additionally, we can use it for staging uh, for rectal cancers, prostate cancer, and esophageal cancer. Moving on to CAT scan, as Sam talked about, this is something that's done quite frequently. How is this performed? Well, it uses type of radiation like X rays that we saw, called X rays that we talked about with plain films. Patient lays down on this table goes up and it goes through this machine. And this machine turns around, spinning out multiple x-rays and creates these multiple thin slices. So unlike the plain film, we got a single panel, it creates multiple thin little slices to give this unique uh, insight into a patient. We often give a patient contrast through their veins to get a better soft tissue evaluation, or we could have them drink and take a look at this small bowel. 
this is our workhorse for cancer imaging. We use this at every stage, whether it's screening, such as this patient who's got a speculated left upper lung mass that's highlighted by the arrow. We saw it at screening lung cancer uh, CT, all the way to restaging after chemotherapy and or surgeries. Moving on to MRI, so what does MRI stand for for people? What it, mean, what it stands for is magnetic resonance imaging. So how is it performed? It looks very similar to a CT scanner. The patient lays down here, the table goes up and slides in, but instead of producing x-rays, this uses a giant magnet that aligns all the um, nuclei, usually hydrogen in the body, and then what happens is the magnets are turned off and then a signal is made, which is captured by the machine and made into an image. What's nice about this, unlike plain films, CT and PET, there is no radiation to the patient because we don't use x-rays to make it, we use magnets. So what do we use MRIs for? We can use it for screening, such as Sam showed, this is a process, we use this quite routinely for patients for prostate cancer and elevated PSA. Here is an example of a primary prostate cancer in the right gland. At the same time, if we diagnose it, we see it, we'll provide staging. Additionally, we can do this if we're screening during staging, such as an MR brain, where we're looking in patients with lung cancers or breast cancers, looking for metastasis, such as seen in this case, this is a left-sided enhancing mass in the brain battle with a brain metastasis. So PET-CT, what is it? How is it performed? This is something I do every day that's a nuclear medicine physician. What happens is we inject a radioactive drug into the patient through their IV or intravenously, and then a special machine is captures the radiation produced by the patient. So similar to a CT and MR, the patient lays on the table and goes in. But unlike the CT and the MR, where they produce either a radiation or a magnet, the patient is the source of the images. The special machine captures all this radiation and then produces the image for the radiologist to review. These are often paired with a CT to help localize where, where the radiation is coming from and to provide accurate staging. Here's an example. This is what's called a PET CT. So the, this bright purple is all the PET and it's put on top of a CT image to create a PET-CT image. So how are these images? What is the agent that we are given? Well, we have a long list of different agents we can give patients, to, and it's determined by the indication. The most common that we use for oncology is called FDG, or fluorodeoxyglucose. It's basically a radioactive sugar. Why do we give them sugar? Because cancers like sugar, and it's taken up by a lot, so we can see where the cancer cells have gone. So when is it used? Staging, such as this Hodgkin's lymphoma patient that Sam alluded to, as well as restaging. These images are, I always think it's always found seeing some of these patients with the extensive, like in this case, extensive lymphoma seen multiple sites, seen throughout the um, axilla, the chest, the abdomen, as well as bone marrow involvement. This image is what could be called a maximum intensity or just an image of stomach looking at the whole body, and we get these images post-chemotherapy, and we see all the tumors gone away. All those areas that were abnormal with the cancer cells, chemotherapy is gone and treated them. They've all gone away. This is a complete response to therapy. So to summarize, imaging is utilized in all aspects of cancer diagnosis, from screening all the way up to restaging. It is often combined with other clinical information to determine accurate station and help formulate the plan for patients' treatments. There's several imaging modalities. Fortunately, we don't have one size fits all imaging tests that is determined by the cancer type and stage. Sometimes we have multiple different, require multiple different imaging test techniques, CT plus MR or MR plus PET, to get the most accurate diagnosis. Thank you very much. And with that, I'll pass it on to Neil, who's going to talk about how cancer diagnosis, introductory essentials of pathology. Uh, thanks so much, Spencer and Sam, for those wonderful talks. All right. Yeah, so I'll tell you about some introductory essentials of pathology today. 
And the learning objectives for um, my portion of the talk are really to understand the, understand the basic principles of pathology, define the different types of biopsies, and then also describe the basic principles of um, processing pathology samples. And then we're gonna uh, be able to describe ancillary studies in pathology that we'll get into. Uh, just a slight warning, as, as some of you may be e eating dinner right now, uh, there are some pictures of pathology specimens in this presentation that some may find challenging to view, and I'll make sure to point those out before, beforehand. Okay, so a broad outline for the talk today, you know, what is the process of making a diagnosis in cancer using pathology? How does one go from a tissue sample here on the left to then looking at it under the microscope to then performing molecular analysis to help our clinical colleagues uh, treat patients? And so I think important to define in that is, you know, what is pathology and what are pathologists? So pathology is the study of disease, and it's really the bridge between science and medicine within, within the clinical field. And it really impacts every part of patient care, uh, from the laboratory tests that are performed when you do blood work, to then looking at the, the biopsies and surgical specimens, uh, and then also the, the, the cutting edge uh, genetic technologies. And so a uh, pathologist is a medical doctor that is trained to uh, examine and make diagnoses on these tissue samples, including uh, both cancerous uh, samples as well as non-cancerous disorders. And so I just wanna give you, this is a little roadmap of how a sample can go from the clinical team uh, through pathology processed and then end up in the hands of a pathologist. And so here uh, we'll start with the different types of biopsies that, that can be performed. So there are many different types of biopsies for many different types of purposes, and they all have their limitations and, advances and, and advantages. So the first uh, uh, couple that have already been mentioned are the needle biopsies, and there are two types of needle biopsies. One is the fine needle aspiration, and also called an FNA. And this is a very, very thin needle um, uh, to take a sample from a mass or a lesion. The next is a core needle biopsy uh, that was mentioned. It's a little bit of a thicker uh, uh, needle. It takes a bigger sample and can um, uh, give us a little bit more sample to work with for diagnosis, like in prostate um, biopsies. The next, which has already been mentioned, is an endoscopic biopsy. So if you uh, undergo a colonoscopy and there's a polyp and the gastroenterologist wants to biopsy that sample, they do an endoscopic biopsy. Next, if uh, you have something on your skin, let's say you have um, a new dark patch on your skin that's concerning for melanoma, they can do a punch biopsy uh, and just take a little bit of a surface of, the, of this new lesion and then uh, send it to pathology for evaluation. Next, biopsies are a little bit uh, bigger and they're called open biopsies. And there are two types of open biopsies. One is an in incisional biopsy and it's where they remove a small portion of a larger mass to then send for diagnostic purposes. And then the next kind is called an excisional biopsy where they um, try to take out the entirety of a lesion by getting around it. And then finally, uh, there's this new, new types of biopsies called liquid biopsies where basically by removing, um, taking some blood samples, they can do some, some novel diagnostic work that we um, might have time to get into today. And so here are some examples of schematics of the different types of biopsies that you can have. Here in the middle, you can see the FNA. You can see it's this very thin needle. They then pull the pathologist or radiologist then pulls up some sample and then puts it onto a slide for diagnostic purposes. The needle core biopsy here on the left, you can see is a little bit thicker and it gives these tissue cores for evaluation. And then here on the right, you can see an example of an excisional biopsy trying to get um, remove this brown spot in the middle. Okay, so once those samples are done by the clinical teams, they're sent to uh, me and my colleagues in pathology. And so evaluation of these surgical specimens or biopsies is performed in the pathology um, uh, grossing station. And so grossing, you know, typically means something that's, you know, off-putting or, or upsetting. Um, but in pathology, grossing is actually means inspecting specimens, uh, describing and measuring uh, the tissue for any abnormalities, and, um, and then, uh, you know, inking the specimen or cutting this, uh, the sample as needed to obtain a diagnosis. And so here you can see a pathologist with his, uh, his ruler. He's measuring a sample, taking down the different characteristics. Uh, the specimen can then be inked by here by these different colors and then can be cut up using these uh, instruments and placed into uh, tissue cassettes for processing. 
And so what that, uh, another way that that can look like is the specimen here, let's say we have a, a sample here. First, the sample is oriented so that we can understand its anatomic location and, or, um, and where it was in the body. So that way we can make sure to refer what we're seeing back to our clinical teams. So we can orient the sample. Then based on those orientations, we then ink uh, to make sure that when we do see something under the microscope, we know that uh, what we saw actually came from a particular part of the sample that we're submitting. Next, we then serially section these samples, uh, also called bread loafing, uh, where we basically cut through them serially and then take certain samples that are of interest to us pathologically. Uh, and so just a quick warning, the next image um, may be off-putting to some. And so if you wanna look away, maybe for the next minute, I think that's, that's reasonable. Um, so here's an example of a colon resection uh, for a patient that had uh, or has invasive colon cancer. And so really from the goal from these specimens is to identify one, the tumor type and two, then the stage and extent of the disease. Here you can see the colon resection specimen. You can see the part of the colon here. This is the fat in yellow. And then in this rectosigmoid area uh, where, the colon, where the cancer is, uh, we're concerned that it might be reaching out towards the margin of the surgical specimen. So we inked it to make sure if we can see tumor um, present at the ink or not. And it also helps with orientation for us. Then when you cut open the sample, you can see here is the, um, the normal um, colonic mucosa. Here's the, the edge of the specimen in, uh, by the rectum. And then you can see this really, um, really uh, upsetting uh, tumor. It's uh, got these very invasive borders. It has these rolled borders. It's, uh, got, it's ulcerated. So this is a really bad cancer uh, that's invasive uh, colon cancer. And then here's just a schematic uh, that has the, the different uh, types labeled. So the rectal mucosa, the tumor, and the others. So then next, once we see that we have the mass here, we then section through this to then evaluate it further. And so here's an example of um, that tumor sectioned through. And so you can see here's the colon or the, the tumor mass here, the colon cancer, and it's white and firm. And then you can see in the, in the colon, there's this muscle layer here, this little white line here. But then what you can see is this tumor actually has a very indistinct border with the muscle, indicating that it's involving the muscle. And then further, when you look in this yellow area where the, the, the fat surrounding the colon, you see all these little white specks. And that's actually the colon cancer invading into the muscle, or sorry, into the fat surrounding uh, the colon. And then finally, you can see this well-circumscribed um, circular nodule here that looks like the colon cancer up here. And this is actually a positive lymph node. So the tumor has spread into the lymph nodes. And so then once we have this image, what we do then pathologically is then take um, basically uh, postage stamp size samples and slices uh, to, pr to pr process. And so you can, so then these are the samples that we would take to demonstrate invasion into the muscle, invasion into the fat and then uh, positive lymph nodes. Okay, and so then the goal of these histology sections as has been mentioned is really to show the depth and extent of invasion for staging purposes. And then this is information is coupled with um, what Dr. Baer said with the imaging. And so you can have a tumor here that's superficially invasive. So it's a stage one. And then as the tumor invades deeper, it has a worse stage. And then finally, if you have uh, lymph nodes, again, you increase the stage of the tumor. And so now that we've taken the samples uh, to process for pathology, we then, um, we then submit them to our histology lab uh, to create the H&E slide, the, hist the histology slides for the pathologist to look at. And so tissue processing, once you have the sample here on the left, it under then undergoes this process known as formalin fixed and paraffin embedded. So we first take the sample and we, uh, and we place it into a um, medium of formalin, which is a chemical fixative, and it basically um, kills the tissue and locks everything in place so that, it, uh, so that it's preserved for uh, long-term evaluation. From um, after it, the sample is fixed, we then uh, dehydrate the sample to actually remove the water in the same way that you know, water can rot um, you know, logs, water can rot samples, and so we wanna remove the water um, so we dehydrate the sample. We then, um, and then we would then replace the water with paraffin uh, seen here and paraffin is a, is a wax. And so once the sample is embedded with paraffin, it's then um, uh, available for long-term storage up to 30, 50, 100 years. And from there, we then embed the sample into um, pathology blocks. So the tissue is embedded by a technologist here where they take uh, the wax and they embed the sample. 
into these tissue blocks seen here in the middle. And then from there, we then use a microtome, uh, you can see here on the right, to cut very thin strips of the sample seen here. So about two microns thick. So very, very small or very, very thinly sliced. And these strips are then placed onto glass slides. These glass slides are then placed um, into an automated stainer um, uh, in batches. And then this stainer seen here, this big machine, then stains um, uh, with uh, hematoxylin and eosin, the main stain that we use in pathology. And so once we have the stains available, we then send that on to the pathologist for um, evaluation. And so um, I think a core concept from this is that tissues and organs have very distinct histo histologic features on, uh, hist on h and &E under the microscope. So for instance, I can look at this sample on the left and see that this is a skin sample. And then in the, this middle panel here, I can see that these are the types of cells that I would see in a normal colon. Uh, and then in this panel here, you can see these different ducts and other uh, types of structures. I can know that this is in the salivary gland. And then finally on the right, looking at this sample here, this is um, some cells in a lymph node of a normal lymph node. And then similarly, cancers have very distinct histologic features on h &E under uh, the microscope. And so here on the left, you can see um, this is what um, melanoma looks like. In the middle here is what colon cancer looks like. And then on the right here, you can see uh, what breast cancer looks like. Uh, and then we also have not just h &E stains, we have lots of other um, special stains or other histochemical stains that can highlight different features we're interested in. Uh, here are two example images of stains that pr um, uh, stain mucin in different ways. So in the colon, you can see these different mucin producing cells. We also have stains that highlight different microorganisms like fungi. So here on the left, you can see these bright um, pink strips. Those are fungus. And then here in the middle, you can see these uh, blacker um, structures that are branched. That's also fungus. And on the right, you can see um, some bacteria stained in purple. Okay, now moving on to the ancillary studies in pathology. So there are many that um, I won't have all the time to talk about, but I wanna introduce you to some of the core concepts of these studies. Okay, and so I think taking a step back, when we have a biopsy, it can be hard sometimes to know what type of cancer it is because you have such a small sample. And similar to this image here, it's hard to tell when you are zoomed in without a lot of context, which fruit is which fruit. Can you, can you tell which is an apple or an orange? And so what these ancillary studies do is really allow us by adding color to better um, identify these distinctions. So I can say there's not only an orange here, but there's a red apple and also a green apple. And so this is very analogous to immunohistochemistry. And so this is adding color to our tissue samples to better identify uh, the site of origin for different cancers and cells. And so um, for immunohistochemistry, also called IHC, we use very specific antibodies targeted towards different proteins labeled with uh, different colors. And then we can actually then look at them under the microscope. So here in the middle in brown, you can see this breast cancer uh, labeled with a, a marker called cytokeratin. And on the right, we have um, the nuclei of this melanoma labeled by a marker called SOX10. Another ancillary tech, uh, technology is called fluorescence in situ hybridization, short uh, or long, uh, you can, it's called FISH. And it allows us to visualize various single gene alterations um, within cancers. And so basically you're adding um, to the cancer cells this labeled uh, nucleotide, and then it binds to a very specific sequence within the genome. And then you can look at it under a microscope. So on the bottom here, this is what normal would look like for a certain probe. You have two red and two green. But in this breast cancer, you can see we have a lot more red samples. And, um, and this probe is to HER2, which is amplified in breast cancer. And you can see that visualized here. And then it's already been mentioned, many cancers have very specific driver mutations for which we have tests. Uh, BRAF uh, with the V600E mutation is one very characteristic mutation for lots of different kinds of cancers. One way we can look for that is something called the polymerase chain reaction, which amplifies very specific sequences of DNA or RNA. So for instance, you can take um, the tumor cells and then have probes specific for the BRAF gene and then undergo these iterative cycles to uh, greatly amplify the amount of uh, gene product that you can see. And then we can then visualize this using different um, uh, readout machines. And so you can actually buy these different cycles, see the increase in read of this specific gene and indicate whether the presence of that mutation is there or not. And that's called PCR. 
And then finally, uh, the next thing to talk about is uh, this thing called next generation sequencing. And so PCR and FISH are wonderful because they're very targeted, but next generation sequencing is really powerful because you can then look at hundreds to thousands of genes at the same time. And that's, that's very useful um, uh, to do. And so for next generation sequencing, we take the genomic DNA from the cancers, we, um, and then uh, shear them into very small fragments put the DNA into, these, um, into this one machine that then amplifies these fragments into very specific clusters. And then these clusters are then uh, on, on this one portion of the machine. And then over that, we then feed in different DNA probes to then uh, say which probe is, is which and, and what's the DNA sequencing. And so you can see, for instance, but in this, in this sample, you can have a T versus an A, G, and then C. And this is actually what it looks like under the microscope uh, to the machine. And then we can use it to actually look for these mutations. And so here's actually a BRCA mutation gene. You can see each little um, letter has a you know one hump here, but then where the mutation is, you can see there's multiple humps per area, and that's actually the, the mutation that we can see in BRCA. And then when you put all of this together, uh, you can really look to detect specific mutations as well as large scale alterations. So here you can see a circle plot of a different of one type of cancer where there's all these interactions and all these mutations that shouldn't be there in a normal cell. And then we use that to uh, undergo genetic analysis to identify these mutations for targeted therapy. Okay, um, I think I'm a little over time. Um, and so just the, the quick take home points, um, you know, pathology uses these very special techniques and tools to evaluate samples, um, to identify the type and stage of tumors. Uh, we then use these ancillary studies that I discussed to help um, diagnose and give prognostic and treatment information. And then finally, pathology is really one component of the entire oncology care team to really help patients obtain uh, the most advanced care available um, to improve their outcomes. And um, with that, here are my references, and um, I look forward to any of your uh, questions, uh, and thanks so much for, for being here. Thank you so much uh, to both Spencer and Neil for those awesome talks on the role of radiology and pathology in cancer care. Um, we have about 10 minutes for Q&A, and we have a bunch of questions in the Q&A, so we're going to try to keep our answers pretty brief to get to as many questions as we can. Um, I'll toss any radiology questions to Spencer, pathology questions to Neil, and I'll try to tackle any clinical questions um, as well. So I'll just go in order that I see them in the Q&A. Is smoking cannabis as dangerous as smoking tobacco, especially if someone has smoked cannabis for many years? Um, smoking tobacco is definitely the biggest smoking-related risk factor. Um, Generally in oncology, we're fine with cannabis overall. I generally recommend edibles over smoking if possible, because whatever is in uh, the cannabis being smoked is not always clear. Sometimes it's combined with tobacco or other potentially toxic or carcinogenic elements. Um, so in general, I recommend against smoking anything, but if uh, someone is going to smoke something, I prefer they smoke cannabis over tobacco. Um, but again, generally recommend edibles. Um, screening for pancreas and cervical cancer in people who have uh, BRCA. Um, so there are um, screening protocols for some of the cancers that we didn't mention tonight. Cervical cancer is a cancer that has a very clear screening protocol with pap smears, and we didn't have time to get into that, but that's another good example of a very effective screening um, in a particular type of cancer. Um, and then there are other cancers, as you imply, like pancreas cancer, where we don't have effective screening for most people, but in someone who does have a known syndrome like a BRCA mutation, um, there are ways that we can look for pancreas cancer in those people. So great point um, that yes, for some people who have inherited high-risk genetic syndromes, there are some special screening protocols for some of those people. Um, continuing down, uh, this one I will uh, maybe ask Spencer to comment on um, is there a role for MRI in breast cancer screening in, say, certain high-risk people like with a BRCA mutation? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, there's indications for patients with high risk, like BRCA1, BRCA2, for annual screening with MR. Yeah. Great. So it's just because, I mean, it's still not 100% sensitive specific, but it's definitely much more than plain films than mammals. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So mammograms for most people for breast cancer screening, but yeah, MRI does have a role for certain high-risk people. Thanks, Spencer. Um, 
how good is diet as a preventative measure for potentially people yeah. higher risk of, of cancer? Um, so we don't have a great evidence that a particular diet is much better than another diet for prevention of cancer, um, though there are suggestions that certain diets may put people at higher risk for colon cancer, gastric cancer. Um, in general, I recommend as healthy a diet as possible, plenty of fruits and vegetables, fiber, and lower fat and lower red meat content. Um, and lower smoked foods content. That's just based on the evidence that there is around what associations might exist between diet and cancer risk, but there's nothing so clear cut that it's as simple as saying, eat this, don't eat that, and you will or won't get cancer. Um, but in general, I just recommend as healthy a diet as possible. Um, here's one for uh, Dr. Newman. How uh, common or rare is infection as a complication of a needle biopsy, especially a hollow needle biopsy like a core biopsy? Yeah, thanks. That's a really that's a really good question. So uh, before you would um, uh, get the biopsy, the pathologist or, or the cytologist or radiologist who would be giving you the biopsy uh, would um, you know, sort of give you the risks and benefits of the procedure. And, uh, and so what they do is do everything to minimize the chance of infection by cleaning the area multiple times and uh, making sure that they clean it afterward as well. And so overall, the risk is exceedingly low and it's similar to when you get a, a shot in your arm. Um, but, uh, but yeah, they, they absolutely want to inform you of that just to make sure you're safe and can look out for signs and symptoms afterwards, but it's very, very low. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In clinical practice, I can't even think of a time I've seen an infection as a complication of a biopsy for cancer, though definitely important to think about in general for procedures. Um, for Spencer, um, can you describe a little about when it's better to do a CT versus an MRI or vice versa? in cancer imaging? So there's lots of different ways times we'll recommend a CT or an MR. I mean, for example, for imaging the lungs, we do CT because air will cause havoc with the MRI. If we're screening for brain metastasis, MR. If we know it's gonna be a patient that is gonna be imaged multiple, multiple times or following like small lesions in the liver, for example, like neuroendocrine tumors, just to try and minimize as much radiation, we'll recommend MR. So we tend to tailor it based upon the indication and the area we're looking at. But those are a couple, for example, again, pulmonary nodules, lung cancer, CTs, brain, and liver, sometimes we'll go with MR. Thanks, Spencer. Um, here's one for you, Neil. Um, why at times might it be recommended to send a tissue sample out to some other laboratory or a reference laboratory? Is it because that other laboratory might have more experience with a particular type of tissue? Yeah, another really great question. And, and so uh, there, there are areas around the country that are sort of diagnostic centers of excellence that have very specific tests available to them. And they are, one, uh, they have the tools available to run them, and um, two, can actually have the ability to evaluate and interpret those, um, those diagnostic tests. So here at UCSF, we have very specific genomic testing, and we have pathologists who can help read those tests. We also have um, additional ancillary tests that other sites don't have. And so these uh, reference labs um, uh, like ours and, and some others are great places to send samples for evaluation. Thanks, Neil. Um, there's a specific question, Spencer, here about what are screening protocols for pancreatic cancer? I'm gonna just comment first and then maybe you can add. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, in general, people are not screened for pancreatic cancer because it's pretty rare, but there are some high risk people where screening may be helpful. Um, some elements of that may include some blood testing, looking for a particular blood test um, around pancreatic cancer. And then there's a couple types of procedures or imaging. One's called endoscopic ultrasound, where they snake something down the throat into the stomach and can use ultrasound through the stomach to actually look at the pancreas. And then there's some good CT imaging that can look really closely at the pancreas as well. Um, Spencer, do you want to add to that? Yeah, no. So what happens if we come in with a patient with suspected pancreatic cancer or high risk, there's two types of things we can do. We can do a multi-phase, what's called a pancreatic protocol. So what do I mean by multi-phase? It's acquired at three different time points. It looks at just how things are picking up the contrast compared to everything else. Another thing we can do too is sometimes we'll do MRs where we look for subtle lesions or we look for anything that's blocking the duct because pancreatic adenocarcinomas will, blank the, will block the duct first. So it gets dilated and we can see it pretty well on MRI. So we'll keep going. We have just two more minutes here. Um, 
does pathology or radiology play a role in determining the type of immunotherapy a patient could be eligible for and how does that work? Um, I'll just comment and say that I, I, pathology, for sure, there's some testing that helps us determine someone's eligibility for immunotherapy. Neil, do you want to comment a little um, on that? Yeah, absolutely. So we can look under the microscope and see if there's a, a bigger amount of immune cells present in a tumor that can indicate to us whether the patient might respond better to a, you know, an, an immunotherapy. And then there are specific um, IHC tests that we can do to say whether there's a presence or not of a specific marker that can be targeted by immunotherapy. So that's, that's absolutely under the realm of pathology and, and ancillary testing. Yeah. All right, last minute here. Do metastatic cancers ever mutate into primary cancers? Like if a colon cancer spreads to the liver, can it lead to a primary liver cancer? I think the quick answer to that is no. If a colon cancer spreads to liver, it doesn't increase the risk for a primary liver cancer. Those are two pretty different um, entities. Um, and I see a last question here. In the future, will there be a blood test for any of the common cancers we listed? Ooh. Um, we've talked about that a little bit previously, and I think we'll hear a little more about that in the final session of the course. Um, I, there is a promising blood test looking uh, for early forms of these cancers, and we're excited to hopefully see that be used in the future. Um, it hasn't, uh, there, there is a blood test we use now that can look for some common mutations in uh, cancers, and again, you'll hear about that in the final session. Um, there may in the future be good blood screening tests looking for early forms of these cancers, but we're not quite there yet. Um, thank you all so much for coming uh, to this diagnosis session. Uh, Dr. Baer, Dr. Newman, thanks so much for your talks. Mm -hmm.